Hey everyone watching on all of our campuses and online, I'm Josh, one of the pastors here with my good friend Joseph. And we're super pumped that you guys are here with us. If you're new, we would love to get to know yeah. you. You can scan that QR code, fill out some information so we can help you take your next best step with Jesus. Also, if you're watching it online and want to get connected, you can just go to oneandall.church slash new. That's, that's a great spot to start. And speaking of things starting, we're jumping into the <laughs> fall, Joseph. And actually, Joseph and I, we're in a community group. And yeah. it's community group season. So that means signups are starting really mm. soon. Joseph, I know you're the youth pastor here. Do yeah. you want to tell us a little bit more about how youth get into community here at One and All? Yeah, honestly, as Josh said, Josh and I are actually in a community group together. And a community has impacted both of our lives because we're doing life together. And that's the heartbeat of ONA Youth. You know, I say it all the time. Life change doesn't happen sitting in a row listening. It happens sitting in a circle processing, actually getting to talk about what's happening in here and in your life. That's actually what discipleship is. It draws you closer to God so you can talk about what God is doing in your life and where he's leading you right now. And so the heartbeat of ONA Youth is that, is community groups. To take these these massive one nights that are awesome, that are incredible, that are hype, but what students need is hope and they need a heart. And so it's really to get them in these small discipleship pockets where you guys as leaders, you, you sitting watching right now, are the ones pouring into these students' lives, doing life with them in an intimate, personal, authentic way, getting to know them by their names, getting to know what's happening in their life. And we've seen so much life change happen from that. We've seen students actually begin to realize, I've got all this anger, all these things that I'm dealing with, I don't know how to process it all. And it's in community that they learn to grow and look more like Jesus. Amen, amen. And I actually was a student in a youth group, and that's really where I found the value of being in a community group and sharing life with others so that I didn't feel alone. And I got to feel even more connected to my relationship with God. Yeah. Pretty cool. And Josh, speaking of community, what does it look like in One and All Kids? I'm glad you asked. Because every single weekend, and parents, you know this, if your kids have been coming to One and All for a long time, our kids are in community groups every weekend when they check in to kids ministry. We have a bunch of different things, worship, message, but all of that gets centered around community groups where, depending on their age, if they're in elementary, more discussion-based, the younger they are, the more activities and crafts and things that they do to get them connected with other kids their age and leaders who lead them to know uh, Jesus better and they talk about life, they pray with each other. That's what it looks like every week. And for kids, since we don't sign up for community groups, the best way that you as a parent, or if you're uh, someone who knows a parent who has a kid, to help them grow best in community and in their relationship with Jesus is to get them to go to a consistent service so they can have a consistent leader uh, with consistent kids so they can build community together and grow not only together in their relationship with Jesus, but individually in their relationship with Jesus. And this weekend, Pastor Jeff is back in week two of our series, All In. Let's jump into service. So now it's the moment we've waited seven days for. Welcome Welcome to to One and All. Can we stand together, church? We sing. I praise in the valley and praise on the mountain. I praise when I'm short and praise when I'm doubting. I praise when I'm numbered and praise when surrounded. Cause praise is the water my enemies drown in. As long as I'm breathing, I got a reason to pray. still in control Hallelujah. my praise is a weapon it's more than a sound my praise is the shout that brings Jericho down yeah as long as I'm breathing we've got a reason to I 
to church so glad to see everybody who is delighted to be in God's house a big shout out to those who are watching online we're so glad that you are joining us today hey um, <laughs> so this past week I uh, I rented a car for the Laos who are here some of you remember the RJ Lal and his wife that were here rented a car for them and then um, so on Friday I jumped in the car and I was like oh, I'm gonna take them back to the airport now, I own a 2003 car, it's old, okay? So I sat in this car and I had no idea why it wasn't starting, okay? I'm like, 2022 or something, it's not starting. What is going on, what's going on? I'm not used to new cars. Then somebody told me, you've gotta put your seal bit on and close the door and then the car will start. Why do they make things so complicated, okay? So, if you're new to our church, we want to help you get connected. It's very simple. Welcome. We want you to get connected. So scan the QR code and sit back in front of you. Let us know that you are here. Also, after church, there are two little tables outside the patio. We would love to meet you, shake your hand, give you a hug, and give you a gift to welcome you to our church. It's very simple to get connected here at One Church. All right, so I want to celebrate something awesome that happened this past Tuesday. 
This past Tuesday, over 492 young adults gathered in this room to worship God. Woo! I'm telling you, God is moving in our young adults. It's amazing. Four people gave their lives to Jesus and seven were baptized. That is what God is doing in our church. Can we give God a shout of praise? Come on. Come on. Oh, if you're a young adult, you're not attending, I encourage you to attend every second Tuesday of the month. All right, we are in our second week of our series called All In. Everyone say All In. All in. Come on louder. All In. All, in. All right, Pastor Jeff is going to bring the message. The notes are in the One All app. Please get your Bible out, your notebook. Get ready to write down some things. Let's pray together. God, we are here to receive from you because you are a good God who wants us to live in communion with you because you have the very best for us. So we pray today that we will listen to you. In your name we pray and everybody said, Amen. Amen. back at one and all church. No? <laughs> all right, turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Matthew 25, verse 41 through 46. Matthew 25, 41 through 46, we're in a series called All In. I want to say something, a couple things as we get started. Number one, you know, uh, every July, it used to be August, but now every July I go away for four to five weeks, and here's, what, here's why you don't see me because I'm preparing for the next 12 months. So this is a time when I go away and ask God, where do you want to take your church? This church does not belong to me, does not belong to the elders, it belongs to who? God. So we go before God and we say, God, where do you want to take your people? Now, every year study break is exciting, but it's never been this exciting. Because it usually takes a couple of days before I start realizing, okay, God, you want to, you want to take us here through reading, through study, through prep, but man, I got to tell you, did you like the Return of the God series that we did? Okay. And you remember earlier in the year when we did the uh, sexuality series on trying to explain where culture is going? You better put your seatbelt on because where God led me during study break, man, I'm telling you, starting in September with the series that we're going to do all church all the way through to next August, it's going to be a ride. And let me tell you, you better bring your Bible. You're going to need your Bible. If you don't own one, get one. But you're going to be writing things in the margin. You're going to be learning things like we did in Ephesians 6. This is a church that believes the Word of God is the objective truth on which we stand. And I can tell you funny stories and jokes, and that might be humorous, but unless you walk out of here with an understanding of the Word and the call of God on your life, it's just entertainment, right? So get a Bible, get ready, and hold on tight. Now, for those of you who are new to our church uh, over the last few months, You've just happened to come in a series that we try to do once a year. We just try to disguise it a little differently because we know we're always getting new people and new people are coming to Christ. And so we always want you to know what we are about. What is this place about? And so we do a series, we rebrand it and brand it again, but we continue to do, to do series to let you know the call of God, the vision God gave us in this church, probably uh, going back to 2010. So now it's what, 12, 13 years old. And what's amazing about that is he gave us the vision. When he gave it to us, we thought, how on earth are we going to do this? Now here we are, and it's done. So when God gives a vision, he gathers his people together. And let me just tell you, you're not here because you read about us on Google. You're not here because a friend invited you. You say, yes, I am. No, you're not. You're here because God brought you here. And if God brought you here, that means you have talents and abilities that only you can use in a distinctly you way to get the job done or accomplish the vision that God has for this church. So you're here for a reason. Now, if you take a look around, 
and what's going on in our world. You don't have to be uh, well advanced in eschatology to know that something's going on in our world, isn't it? No matter what your view of the book of Revelation, you got to stand up and take notice of moving toward a one world government, toward an international currency, what's going on in the state of Israel, the conflicts in the Middle East. You don't have to be a professional when it comes to Revelation to know things are happening. These are the signs of the times. And so it doesn't surprise me then, as I go up to Mammoth to prepare where we're going to go the next year, God keeps giving me series like, hey, I want you to talk about the four parables Jesus told before the end. Okay, I can do a series on that. I want you to talk about demonic possession in the Old and New Testament and what are the things we should expect to see in culture. What are some of the things we should expect to see creeping into the church? And how are we then supposed to live the whole Easter series next year on hope? How do we have hope when the world is going in a direction that is not friendly to the Christ follower? So on and on it goes. Before we take this great journey, we have got to ask the question. And it's probably, I think it's the most important question you could ask outside of, am I saved? Am I in a right relationship with God? C.S. Lewis, he loved using this example. He said, if I took a tape recorder and I tied it to your hip, and the only time it recorded is when you said to somebody else, you ought to do something. As soon as the word ought came up, it triggered the recorder and it recorded everything you said. And then on judgment day, when you stand before God, the only thing you're going to be judged on is what you said yourself others ought to do. And what he's saying is, even if you don't believe in the Mosaic Code, even if you don't believe in the Ten Commandments, even if you don't believe in an objective moral law, if you're just judged by that, you still fail the test. And the whole point was, C.S. Lewis said, everybody needs grace and mercy and forgiveness, and that's the message of the cross, right? Okay, now I want to take a similar example, turn it on its head, and this is what I want to do this weekend. Let's say I attached a tape recorder to you. This, when you go out of here, we're going to attach a tape recorder to you. It'd be scary, wouldn't it? And we're going to record everything you say and everywhere you go over the next month. And then we're going to ask you to turn that tape recorder in, and we're going to make uh, a summary, kind of like clef notes, about what your life is really about based on your conversations in every place you went. If we did that, now you got to be honest here. Come on, this is, woohoo, we're, we're starting this journey. If you could see, if you could feel what's in my head right now about where we're going in the next year, you got to ask this first. What is your life really about? I, if you're here and you're visiting and you're not a Christ follower, you still got to ask this question. What is your life? Not what you say it's about. What is it really about? What drives you? What is your purpose? What gives you meaning? What causes your heart to beat a little faster? What are you most passionate about? You know, if you have a triangle here, I can't remember who used this, but if you listed everything that's important to you in that triangle, you have more space, but as you move to the top, it's, there's only room for one thing. What is the one thing? What drives you? Now, Jesus tells this parable that, well, most parables disturbed me when I first started studying Scripture because I was always trying to harmonize works and grace. And then I come to this parable in Matthew 25 that I told you to turn to. Most of us are familiar with it. It tells us that at the end of time, there's no gray. That Jesus is going to put everyone in one of two categories. Either you're a sheep or a goat. You know, there's no pigs. You know, there's no donkeys. Sheep or goat, one or the other. And he's going to put the goats on the left and the sheep on the right. Now, here's what he says, and I'm just summarizing it. And then remember, this is one of the parables that we'll look into later on because this is an end-time parable. He's trying to get people ready. And here's what he says in verse 41. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick in prison, and you did not look after me. They will also answer, or they also will answer, rather, in verse 44, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, verse 45, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Now, here's the problem I had with this parable or 
this saying or teaching for a long time. All the rest of the Bible tells me I'm saved by faith, saved by grace through faith. This almost seems to be implying that I'm saved by works. It almost seems to imply this. Well, if I feed those who are hungry and clothe those who need clothing and I visit people who are sick and those in prison, I'm going to go to heaven. How can I possibly harmonize that with everything else I read, especially in the, the deepest theological book ever written in the book of Romans, where Paul clearly says in Romans 2, Romans 5, and Romans 8, that we're justified by faith, not works, that there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But here Jesus himself says, I'm going to separate you into sheep and goats. Here's how you know the sheep, here's how you know the goats. And the answer is what you've heard me say probably for the last 15 years. There is a cause and effect to the gospel. That is, if there's true transformation in your life, there are going to be some activities in your life that come as a result. The Apostle Paul said, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. We've said around here, he not only changes what you do, but what you want to do. So if you, listen now, this is so crucial, because we live in a time of total subjectivity. We think that how I feel determines what is real and what is true. It doesn't. There is an objective truth. If you have been changed by the power of God in your life, it means, guess what? You have new passions you didn't have before. You're not perfect in those passions. Pragmatically, we're all still sinners and we still fight with the old ugly man or woman. But there's something happening in us. We now have a passion for the afflicted. We may not be perfect in it, but we have passion. We have passion for the Word of God. We have a passion. We want to be part of His kingdom and what He's doing on planet Earth. We have a passion for sexual purity. We have a passion for worship. That's why... When somebody says to me, and I hear this so often today, somebody will say, well, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. My question to you is this, why do you not want to be with God's people? You do realize that's what heaven is. For all of eternity, you're going to be hanging out with God's people. If you don't want that now, why on earth would you want that then? That there are passions that come up. You try to approach God legally like that, I've got a concern about your heart. What is your life? This is the greater point. When you become a Christ follower, your desires change, your passions change, you're not perfect in them, you still need grace, we're all sinners, I got it, but suddenly you find yourself praying for your enemy. Not all the time, but sometimes you'll shock yourself. Sometimes you really wish someone who's done you wrong well. You start forgiving people who've offended you. You start controlling your temper. You can't believe it. You start wishing people... This addiction that you had in the past suddenly is gone. You don't want to do it anymore. And the only explanation is that the Spirit of the living God has overtaken you. Now, please hear what I'm saying. We've said it like this. When the Spirit of God comes in you, you see things you've never seen. You feel things you've never felt. And you began to, you began to have a sense of volition. You're able to do things you never thought you could do, like say no to something you should say no to. This is the question we have to answer before we go forward where we're going to go. I know you have other loves, but what is your greatest love? I know there are other tasks. We have to live in this world, but what is your supreme task? You have other callings in your life. I got it, but what is your ultimate calling? We have to work. We got jobs. We have to earn money. We have to earn a living. We marry. We date. We have children, whatever it is. We have hobbies. But what is your ultimate pursuit, your ultimate objective? Jesus asks you that again and again and again. Ecclesiastes is a wonderful book written by the teacher. Solomon, some say just the teacher is not identified, but the reality is Solomon, what does he do? The whole book of Ecclesiastes is like taking an onion and peeling back the layers. And Solomon says, well, I had wealth, tried that, that didn't work. Had power, tried that, that didn't work. Had popularity, had family, had marriage, had friends, had ease, had comfort, had luxury, had pleasure. And then as a tired old man, he gets to the end of the book and here's what he says. And I read it in Ecclesiastes 12. Now all has been heard. Here's the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. Summed up, here's what he says. At the end of the day, the ultimate purpose of our lives is to live for God and his purposes in the world. 
See, that's how you know you're in. Not that you're perfect, not that you never sin. Here's how you know that your heart has been transformed. You got all these other responsibilities, all these other objectives. I got it. All these hobbies, that's good too. I think God wants you to enjoy His world. I do. When I'm on the golf course, I am worshiping God just as much as I am when I'm hanging out with my kids. I'm enjoying His beauty and His creation. Now, everything in moderation, I get that. But no matter where I am, no matter where you are, our primary objective should be, I want people far from God to come near, and I want to build the kingdom of God with my life. Okay? That's it. Now, how does that all fit in with where we're going as a church? Folks, this church has been so blessed with leaders long before I got here. And if you take the leaders that were before me and then you put me together with them, this church is unapologetically and has always been unapologetically evangelistic. Ron Keller wanted to see the next generation come to Jesus. He was willing to do whatever he had to do to reach the next generation. Chuck Moore came in, had an incredible youth ministry and reached people who were far from God. They came near and some of you are a result of that ministry. But isn't it true that the more God trusts us with the little, will he not trust us with much? There is a momentum in this place that I have not felt since I became pastor. This church makes a beeline for the gospel. We truly believe that we can have a fully devoted follower in every home in this valley. We actually believe that. But we also know you have to count the cost. Before you go to battle, you got to consider the plans that lead to success. Before we build a tower, we got to draw up the plans and consider the cost. Now, I want, to th I want you to think about something. Come on, this is fun. It's not, okay, I'm not helping you with your pain and suffering right now. I got it. And I'm not helping you. How are you going to face tomorrow? I'm trying to call you out to something. Because in, it, before you can enjoy all of that that we're going to get to, you got to decide what you're living for. Because it makes all the difference. Who are you really? Not who you say you are. What drives you? What are you passionate about? Now, let's, let's think about something quickly. 2010, God gave us the vision. Here's what it was. We were one church, one location right here in San Dimas. And we kept asking God to provide us a huge facility somewhere. We were having seven services at one time. Did you know that? Seven services every weekend. And Mike will tell you here, I ended up in the hospital. You can't preach seven times like this. And get away with it. And you just get, you get overwhelmed, but you're trying to find out space. But I guess it's because of the missionary background in me, I did not want to go in $60 million debt in some big facility. And so I prayed and God said, let's go wide. And so we did. We saved tons of money. Woo! And we were able to expand by going wide. So we asked God for four. He gave the vision of four campuses. And we were one at that time. And we had this vision of a care center in the middle, because here's the problem. As a minister and a pastor all my life, it's very frustrating when I meet somebody on the street, or I meet somebody that needs my help, and all I can do is pray for them. There's a, there's a passage in the scripture that says, that's not what Christ wants. Go warm and be filled, but you don't do anything about it. So I thought, if we had this care center where we could feed people, clothe people, counsel people with addictions, where we can do any, we can meet any need in this valley. Wouldn't it be great Then anytime one of our pastors on those campuses met somebody, they could say, I'm going to not only pray for you, let me take you over to God's pantry. And now here we are. You look down on the valley. We got the four campuses. I mean, look what God has done. San Dimas, West Co., Upland, Rancho. And in the middle... This beautiful place called God's Pantry. Do you know the miraculous nature of God's Pantry? Do you know during COVID, we fed 200, sorry, 2,500 families every week? Do you know how much food that is? Clothing, counseling, food, clothing, education, counseling, all free. And now do you know that they have done such a good job that they're getting grants? Did you know that? They're getting grants from the state of California. We... You sacrificed and gave them the seed money, and God said, oh, you're going to invest in something outside yourself? Well, if you're going to do that, I'm just going to pour out the blessings on this organization. And Tom Sweeney and the, the people who work at God's Pantry, it's amazing. We, I mean, I knew that God could do something great, but it is true. You can never imagine. He can do more than you 
imagine. is immeasurably more than you could ever hope or imagine when God's people sacrifice the way you did. I believe that when God calls you to do something, he equips you to do it. And I want you to know that One and All Church has gained a very positive reputation in our community and in our valley. Let me just give you a few bullet points, okay? Number one, we have monthly serve projects in four cities so that we can make people aware of the need and meet the needs of the people who are less fortunate. We partner with the Department of Child and Family Services for Pomona and L.A. Serenity Services. This year, we made 1,500 foster care kits for foster children. We've cleaned up 10 public parks. We partnered with Bob Hope USO as we made 3,000 hygiene kits for our military men and women who are deployed. We made 7,900 meal kits for families in need and tornado victims. We've collected and distributed 1,800 backpacks for Back to School Project this year alone. Now multiply that over 12, 13, 14 years. On July 28th, just a few weeks ago, we served almost 1,000 children. At a back to school event, we offered backpacks, school supplies, free haircuts, and Handel's ice cream. Come on now. We partner with Rancho Cucamonga, Fontana, Alta Loma, Covina, Charter Oak, Ontario, Montclair, Upland, uh, Bonita Unified, and West Covina School Districts to meet the needs of children in our communities. And that's not to mention Toy Store. On Christmas when the kids come in who otherwise would not have a Christmas and we walk them through and they get to meet Santa and they have their gifts wrapped, they choose whatever gift they want. We go all hundreds of bicycles away. I always like to get around to every campus because it'll bring a tear to your eye, man. The compassion, the people who give their time to reach out in love and service with no strings attached. You know, we're not saying, hey, come to Toy Store, but you've got to come to church on Sunday. No, we just love you because you're created in the image of God and we're going to meet your needs. And all that, what I just said, is a drop in the bucket. I can't believe how much Michael's team and our local outreach, as well as our global outreach, how much they're able to accomplish through this ministry. 10,000 families every month. 10,000 families are, are ministered to through God's pantry every single month. And we continue to pr provide uh, resources for the homeless. There are 200 active team members right now are part of the Compassion Network, helping with serve projects in our local communities, changing the city one life at a time. And I love the t-shirts they're wearing. I love my city. I just love it. I love my city. Now, you know as well as I do that benevolence is good. But it's not enough. You give them food, you feed them for a season. You give them Jesus, you feed them for eternity. The only food that lasts is spiritual food. The only clothing that lasts are garments of salvation. Only robes of righteousness given by Christ himself can replace all of our filthy rags. And that's why at our church we believe that a calling on our life is that we walk across the room. That's another statement that we use that we believe evangelism is done best one-on-one. -on -one. We believe that the day is over, and not that we'll never do it, but the primary way to help somebody far from God come near to God is no longer a big crusade. Although that may work in some place, I got it. I'm not, I'm not being negative toward that. I'm saying that what we've learned is that every generation, the vision never changes, but your strategy changes with each generation. And the best way now to reach this generation is when we have what we call a one life. One life. So we end our services by saying one hope, one life what, in Christ. Why do we do that? To remind you that at any given point in your life, all of us should have one person who is far from God that we're investing in. You say, well, I can't do that. Yes, you can because everybody can pray. And what you do, you say, God, I don't have this one life. Would you bring that person into my life? And you'll be surprised. That God suddenly will bring them across your path. And then, patiently, you're meeting with them, inviting them into your home, and God will show you. You pray, God, open the door. When the door is open for me to speak the gospel into this person's life, through your Holy Spirit, lead me, guide me. And it's amazing, the stories. You have no idea the stories that we hear around here all the time when somebody says, God, send me a one life. They do. Next thing you know, they're getting baptized. These stories go on and on and on. But we also know that, as we say often, direction, not intention, determines destination. Just because you intend to have a one life does not mean that you will. Just because you intend on having a good marriage does not mean you will. Just because you intend, intend on having good children 
<laughs> there has to be direction. You have to have habits in your life. Those habits determine the destination. We say that we are the ambassadors of Jesus Christ as though Jesus is making his appeal through us. We say that we are God's plan to reach the world and there's no plan B. Now, can we celebrate just for a moment? What has God done since he gave us this vision? And I say God. I say God. It's his doing. What's he done since we had the vision? I'll tell you what. There's been over 2,000 salvations since he gave us that vision. 2,000. You say, 2,000, where are they? Some are here, some are not. Some are in Nashville, some have moved to Boise, Idaho. People move and shift, it's transient. Our job is to help people far from God come near. That's what we're doing. And sometimes they even end up in the other churches. That's okay. We are kingdom-minded around here, man. We just want to help people far from God get near, and then wherever God sends you, wherever he equips you, wherever he disciples you, we're just going to celebrate. There have been over 5,000 baptisms since the vision was given to us. And right now, there have been over 1,000 people serve in I Love My City. Now, there are two other major areas. And again, if, if you're new here, and even if you're not new here, you need to be reminded. We not only want people far from God to come near to God, we want people who are near to God come nearer. We, we want people to grow in their faith. That's why we've determined that we're going to preach the Word of God. And we're going to preach it unapologetically, unashamedly, but we're going to stay true to the Word of God. No matter where culture goes, we're preaching the Word of God. And we're going to teach the Word of God. But can I tell you, if God is leading me to teach you these specific messages that are coming up in the next 12 months, because he knows where culture's going, then can I tell you that your ability to weather the coming storm is directly tied to your spiritual maturity, okay? Your ability to weather what's coming, because the Bible says when these times of storms come, if you've built your house on the sand, what's going to happen? You'll have many fade away. If you build it on the rock... The foundation will be strong. The thing about storms is it separates the wheat from the chaff. So our responsibility is to help people who are near God to God go nearer. And you can't dictate the events of your life, but you can dictate your response. And our job, our job is to help you dictate your response. James 1 tells us that blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life. That tells me that some will not persevere under trial. And it will be directly tied to your maturity. Now the question is, how does one become mature? We have, because we are intentional at one and all, we have what is called the growth path. It's on the screen behind me. A person receives Jesus, and then we talk to them about baptism, because that's what happened in Acts chapter 2 in the first church. And then we go into this growth path where we want you to know God. Colossians 1.9, Paul says, I want you to know the surpassing greatness of God. So we, we want you involved in things that where you're going to learn about God, who he is, his character, his nature, his involvement in your life. And then as you continue to grow in your knowledge of God, that you begin to grow together. That we're all in what we call growth groups because life is done best together. When you're around the people of God, you hold each other accountable, you learn the word, you pray together, and you go from strength to strength. And then after that, we know that you're making progress on the growth chart or path because now you start serving. See, once you start to know God and his heart, you have a passion for the things of God, and then you start doing community with the people of God, and the next thing you know, you have this overwhelming desire in your heart to serve those who are far from God. And then, then we know you're all in when you go all in. First Timothy 6, 17 says, be rich in good deeds. Now, stay with me here. See, I had to hide the other side of the board because I, I was afraid if I showed it to you first, you might walk out. <laughs> now you know why. Now listen to me. L listen, listen. If you're new here and you're thinking, oh boy, not this again, it, talk to somebody around you and they'll tell you this about Pastor Jeff. Number one, Pastor Jeff doesn't know who gives what. Number two, Pastor Jeff says, there's no way I can manipulate or coerce you to give anything. 
It comes as a result of where you are with Jesus, and that's between you and, the, and God. But my job is to teach you what it is that we celebrate around here and how we look at the resources God has given us. And you're going to hear some message in this series, some messages about this. Now, let me, let me, let me remind you of something. So God has done all of these things with so many sacrifices. When I was a little boy, uh, 12, 12, 13, I guess that's not that little. I, I, you know, my parents weren't wealthy. I had three brothers. We lived, in, we all had, we lived in the same bedroom, one bedroom for four boys, two double bunk beds. There wasn't any video games back then, kids. I know you can't imagine that. No, no video games. We worked in the garden most of the time and played baseball out in the yard with our parents. Good days. But when the summer came, I wanted money. So I got this idea that I would go over to Golf Course Acres. Now, I wasn't a golfer then, but that's where all the wealthy people lived. All the doctors and lawyers lived in a place in my hometown. Google it sometimes, Golf Course Acres, Elizabethan, Tennessee. And I went and knocked on their door. So here's this 12-year-old, and I said, can I mow your grass, please? And they kept saying yes. Yeah, well, yes, son. How much you charge? $20. $20 a yard. Now, the doctor's yards were huge. I wasn't used to this. And I had a little bitty mower, and I remember that. I, you know, I wasn't out there riding anything. So I realized I wanted to try to make $100 a week so that I could have cherry slushies and hot dogs with cheese and, and three musketeer bars. That's what I grew up on. I wanted those every day. So I thought, I'm going to mow grass. So my mother would drop me off with the lawnmower in the back of the car. I'd put the mower out, and, I'd, and this little mower. Now, you can imagine, 12 years old. It take, so I realized it takes me an entire day to mow one yard. <laughs> These were huge yards, folks. Tennessee, all land for Africa. One day, my father came to me and said, son, you're working hard, and I, I know your brother's a little angry with you because you won't share your cherry slushies and your hot dogs. He said, but dad, I'm doing all the work. I can't get him to help me. He says, okay, son, I got an idea. My dad was a lawnmower repairman, so he came to me and said, son, I'm going to help you. I said, how? He said, I'm going to build you a riding lawnmower. My father built me a rider. Now I was officially an entrepreneur. <laughs> I thought I was the king, man. I got my cassette tape. Uh, that's a little, never mind. Got my little headphones on. I'm riding this morning. Man, I'm king, and I'm, I'm putting that thing in high gear, and I'm mowing two yards a day now. Yeah, oh, yeah. So I mow the yard, have a lunch break with salmon's hot dog and a cherry slushie, and I go back and I do the second yard. Now I'm making $200 a week, and my father was providing the fuel. Okay. Now, why did I tell you the story? The bigger the horsepower engine, the more you can do. The bigger the horsepower engine, the more you can do. In most mega churches in America, you've heard me say this before, somewhere between 18 and 22% of the people give all the funds to accomplish the work. And I have always asked the question, man, if we could just get 50% involved. So around here, we encourage people to understand what the New Testament and Old Testament patterns of giving are. And we put this on before, and I just want to explain it to you just quickly. And why would I do this? In hopes that you'll get all in and come on board. See, as a Christ follower, we see everything that comes to us is from the hand of God. Everything we have is from God. Now, we all say that, but we don't actually live like it. And because of that, we believe the Bible teaches you give 10% of what comes into your hand. Now, I shocked people the first time I did this, and I think some people started giving less because I said, if you make 80000 a year, you don't get 80000 The government takes it right off the top. So what comes into your hand is more likely 65000 Well, if you're tithing on 65000 that's 6500 And so that's your tithe per year. Now, nobody comes to your house from our church. Are you giving your tithe? That's not the way this works. Nobody comes, you better sign this contract. No, that's we, my job is to teach you what I believe the Scripture teaches. This is not a works thing. You're still saved by grace through faith. Nobody's going to hell tonight, Okay. Well, unless you don't have Jesus, that's another story. 10%. So 58, 500 of what you make actually belongs to you. Now, the reason we put it like that is, here's what the Bible seems to teach through Malachi and through 2 Corinthians, and we'll deal with some of this later. The Bible seems to teach this. Not as a form of legality now, but here's the Bible's principle of teaching. And that is that in order for you to demonstrate what you say you believe, that every good and perfect gift comes from Father, and everything you have comes from God. God says, give me the first fruits. Give me the first fruits for the things I'm doing in this world. 
Now, if you're really passionate, and think about it, if your heart's been changed, say, man, more than, now you've got all these other passions, but if you're saying to yourself, man, more than anything else, I want to play a role in the kingdom of God, this is not going to be a tough thing for you. It's not, it's not, it's going to be easy. Because think about it. If God gives you everything, he gives you all this, and he says, you do with that whatever you want to, I get this. As a sign that you, you believe what you say you believe, and here's why. Give God the first fruits. And that, that goes all the way back. Forget about Mosaic Code. Forget about the Ten Commandments. This goes all the way back in the garden with Cain and Abel when they brought the very best, the first fruits, to show God, God, we, we admit, we confirm every good and perfect gift comes from you. And then we say, invest in the thing that pleases the heart of God and makes the heavens rejoice. Well, what, what pleases the heart of God and makes the... The Bible clearly says what happens in heaven when one sinner repents. There's a big party. And then resist giving God the leftovers. This is the big, this is the huge issue with God and his people. Okay, no matter what it is, don't do this. Don't say, okay, I'm going to take care of everything that I like, everything that I love, and if I have anything left over, God, you get it. Look, don't do that. Just for your own spiritual health, don't do that. Even if you disagree, some of you, well, I'm a Bible scholar and I don't see that 10% thing. Okay, okay, okay. How about first fruits? Do you see that? What are your first fruits? See, I don't want to make this some kind of legal thing that determines whether you go to heaven or hell. I'm simply trying to tell you the ultimate question of your life is what drives you? Where's your greatest passion? What motivates you beyond everything else? And if it's the kingdom of God being built in your life, this is not going to be an offensive thing to you. This is just your starting point. This is important because I want to show you. Here's how I want to end. Oh, man, we are so on time. Now we can go to this. Can I tell you something? I, I haven't been, I just have not been this excited in ministry for a long, I think part of it is because, have you noticed my haircut? And have you, have you noticed I've dropped like 12, 15 pounds? You know why? I'm in fighting mode. I'm in my fighting weight and my, my hair short. I, I am ready to go. And I love it because I'm 50. I'm going to be 59 next, uh, the end of this month. And I'm ready. I'm, every time I come back from study break, okay, God, if this is where you're taking us. I, I love you guys. I, I love you. And I love being here. And I, 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 I love California. I know that's crazy. I can't help it. I love LA. I love, I'm not going to Boise. And I'm not, I love this place, man. Okay, we got problems politically. We got taxes. Gas is high. Who cares, man? I love it here. We're, we're, we're in this together. So let's do something with the rest of our lives. Let's make a difference right here in L.A. While, every, while people are fleeing, let's you and me, let's stay around and change the world. And so, so here's what, here's what if, if everybody gets all in, Pastor Michael's going to be thrilled because all these ideas he's got about San Dimas campus, woohoo! Matt Chavez is knocking it out of the park at West Co. I don't know if you've been down there, man, but I walk in there to preach sometimes. Man, they're ready before I get there. It's incredible. He needs a building. Now, he doesn't need a $60 million monstrosity, but they are, they're meeting in a, in, a, in a, what's it called? Community center. They need a little place, even if it's a little building somewhere, just of their own. Rancho is exploding suddenly. They're growing every week now. They need a few more staff members. They need somebody to work with youth. Because you know, you, if you go to a church and you like the church, but there's nothing for your kids, you're not staying. And you know it. And Upland is growing. And it's got some of the cream of the crop of our people. And we're waiting to see what God's going to do there. But if everybody gets all in, man, we're gonna, it's going to be a great next three to five years. As, we write, as I write the vision for three, five, and the next ten years, and as our elders approve it, we're going to give you more and more information. But there's so much we can do just to, just if everybody gets on board, if everybody gets all in. Let me tell you one thing. I want to whet your appetite a little bit. I don't know why God has done this, but over the last 15 years, our sermons are being broadcast all around the world. It's called One and All Media. I didn't ask for this. It kind of came to me from Australia. And now with our sermons going all over the world, you know what's happening? I'm getting calls of people wanting us to start One and All Churches all around the world. Okay. <laughs> Let me tell you what excites me. Let me tell you what really excites me is post-Christian Europe. Nobody's going to speak the gospel to Indians better than Ajay Law. 
You know, there's no need for this white missionary to go to India. I mean, come on. We get behind Ajay. He's going to be the man. There's no need for me to go to Zimbabwe, Africa when Denford's there doing all this fantastic work. My job is to resource him so he can go from strength to strength, right? Our job. Something unique is happening in post-Christian Europe because of our radio program and what we're doing online and some of the very gifted people in our media. Our popularity is off the charts in post-Christian Europe. You remember, you remember, a few, remember a few weeks ago we had the founder of God TV stand up in our service? Were you here when that happened? So the founder, God TV, I don't even know what that is. And I'm not really impressed by cable stuff. But God TV is huge in Europe. Huge. Here's a guy, Ian Young. He was a fisherman, making tons of money, entrepreneur, had a vision and met Christ through the gospel, sold his business and started God TV. And now they're asking him to come into places like Jordan, Jordan, Islam, And they're inviting Christianity in. He calls me and says, hey, Pastor Jeff, would you come to Petra? And would you walk around just talking about all the historical sites associated with the gospel? We'll film it, get it on, and we'll show it in Turkey. I said, okay. I don't know when, but let's talk. Here's my point, though. I spent my study break last year in Georgia and Armenia. And everywhere I went, I don't know if God was just showing me something. I go to cafes. I found a good coffee shop. I drink coffee, and I sit there for about six to eight hours. In both Georgia, which is post-Russia, and Armenia, there were young men and women reading Bibles. And there's no evangelical churches in either one of those countries. I walked over to one young man. I said, hey, can I, can I ask you something? Because they speak English. It's broken, but I said, can I ask you what you're doing? He goes, I'm, I'm reading this book. I said, is that the Bible? Because, you know, I could tell by the back and everything. And he said, yeah. I said, well, are you a Christian? And he said, basically said, well, I don't, know, I don't know what that is yet. Who gave you the Bible? Well, come to find out in both Armenia and Georgia, Armenia it declares itself as a Christian country. Did you know that? But nobody goes to church, really. They only go for funerals and weddings. So you've got a whole young generation growing up all through, and we've done our homework, all through post-Christian Europe, you've got a young generation that is not close to the gospel because they have no bad experience with it. They're searching Now, in our church, we've got a young adult movement happening. Have you heard? Have you heard what's going on here? (laughs) Chris Crumley showed me a photo, it was last Tuesday, of the young adult meeting. She said almost close to 500 people, 500 young adults in this room. That's more probably than what's here right now. Can you see it? There's a movement of young people coming here. Can you see us? And this this is dreaming now. Nothing's for sure, but this is where we're dreaming. We equip and train them and send them into these areas for two years with the Timothy Foundation that teaches and trains young people to go in and start conversations because I'm not interested in building buildings. Uh, uh, The organic church of Acts 2, just get people together and start talking to them and teaching them the gospel. I mean, wouldn't it be amazing if this little church in San Dimas continues on its way of revival, and at the same time, this is where God is calling us. But you're only as strong externally as you are internally. We can never forget that our primary focus has to be here in this valley, helping people far from God come near. But what's he doing? There's all these. So I'm, come on, man. You've been coming here for a couple of years. Drop the anchor. Drop it. Get involved. Get on the growth path. Use your gifts and your talents. And your Because I go back to this. Jesus is going to come back. And when he comes back, man, I want to be able to hold my head high and say, you know what? I did all these other things. But you know, Jesus, my primary passion was building your kingdom. Man. Woo. Yeah. You still got to work. I got it. You still got to work. You still got your family. You still do it. But man, my, I'm always looking, God. I'm always looking. How can you use me? And I am so thankful for you. Man, I'm at the right place. And we're in this thing together. And we're going to see this through. So let me go back. Let me close like this because I'm right on time. Well, I'm going to be a little late, but not too bad. So West Coast, Rancho, Upland. Come on now, San Dimas. Remember the blue hole I told you about back in Tennessee? It's this place up in Hampton, Tennessee, where I would go in the summer and swim with my friends. It's called the Blue Hole. You really ought to Google it sometime. It's called the Blue Hole. It has different pools, and a lot of the pools are somewhere between 15 to 20 feet deep, but it has one section called the Blue Hole that no one's ever touched the bottom. 
or at least not when I was growing up. I'm sure some scuba divers done it by, well, I don't know that for certain either, but it was cold. But, you know, all your friends would tell you, hey, you're not a man till you jump in the blue hole. You know, you double dog dare you jump in the blue hole. So you get on this big rope swinging from this tree and they'll tell you, man, you got to let go. Swing out. So I, st- I swung out and man, I just did not want to let go. You know, you, you, people have died at the blue hole, seriously, trying to go down and stay down too long, got caught, whatever, who knows. But I'm on this rope and I just don't want to do it. I got my whole life before me. And they said, just let go, you coward. You know, they're, they're shouting at you and I can't say some of the things they were saying. Uh, but when they started talking about my mother, that really made me mad. And so, <laughs> boom, I went out and I let go. And man, that was the coldest water. But it also was exhilarating, so exhilarating. And I went back. I spent most of my summers in my high school years there. Some of you, you're never going to learn all this until you just dive in. Whether it's your tithing, your giving, your serving, your growth groups, can I tell you something? Jesus tried to tell you, if you try to save your life, you'll lose it. But if you give your life over to something bigger than yourself, you're going to find it. And the reason you're depressed and sad and anxious is because your soul knows it's not living for something that matters and you can't trick your soul. When your soul knows that you're living for something beyond yourself, even though you're a sinner, even though you do things you wish you hadn't done, even though you're still repenting, you're still worshiping, you're still trying this thing called the spiritual battle, down deep inside, your soul will know what it's really living for. And when you live for what really matters, it changes everything. Oh man, come on. Let's c- come with me. Come with me. Not now, but just let's, let's do this together, okay? We, we love L.A. You know, we love San Dimas. We love, we love them all, and we're going to do this together. We're not running and hiding, man. We are called for such a time as this. Father, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for the power of your word. And I pray in Christ's name right now that we would have a renewed energy and passion. We're going to live our lives for something that really matters. We're going to stay in the word. And as we learn and read the word, we're going to be changed by it. We can't wait to study your scripture in the coming year and to learn all the things that you're teaching us. Father, may this church always stand on the objective word and the authority of your word for our lives. And may we encourage each other with it and challenge each other with it. But as we're doing that, as we're growing, for those who are close to God coming closer, help us never to forget you have called pastors and leaders in the past to help people far from God come near as we have been unapologetically evangelistic, so also in the future, realizing that you have given us much, require much from us, that we might change the world, starting right here. In Christ's name, everybody said, amen. Amen. All right, I want to do something different. We're going to try a little something. Don't be scared, okay? (laughs) We do decision time on weekends. Michael comes out or somebody will come out and talk to you. I I want to ask all of you to stand where you are right now. You hear sermons all the time. We are are a spiritually well-fed community in America because there's so many great preachers and teachers. You can watch them on YouTube. You can go to Rotten Now Media. You you know, you got a great diet. And the problem with that is sometimes you can have so much of that, you take it for granted. So what I want to do right now, some of you heard, you heard this message just now. Some of you know you've never lived ultimately for Christ and you need to make a decision that today you're going to draw a line in the sand and today's the day you say, you know what, God, Pastor Jeff's right. I'm empty frustrated, something's not right, and he told me what's not right. I'm not living for anything other than myself. My life is egocentric. It's about me. It's not theocentric about God. Then I want to stand right here, and as we sing together, I want you to come up and shake my hand, look me in the eye, and I want to greet you and tell me I've made a decision today. And tell me what the decision is. Some of you need to make a decision for Jesus. Say, you know what? I've never made a decision for Christ. Some of you need to make a decision for service. I'm going to start serving I'm gonna, I don't know where it is, but I'm going to find some. A lot of you need to make the, I can tell you, about 76% of you need to make the determination today. I'm going to start giving the first fruits of my life to the kingdom of God, what I say matters most to me. So as we sing, I'm going to stand right here. And I'm going to invite our decision counselors up. If they'll come over and take their place on my right-hand side here. And after, I, you've, after I've greeted you and welcomed you, I'm going to hand you to them and they're going to pray with you. We want to make this less transactional and more spiritual. We're not trying to get your information. 
We're not trying to do something you don't want to say. We're just simply trying to challenge you and get you to go your next step, whatever it is. Now, they may tell you to scan the QR code and go your next step because there's got to be something practical to this. But this is a spiritual moment. And if God led you to make a decision right now, I'll greet you here and encourage you in that decision. And then somebody will pray with you. But don't let it go by. If, if you were moved by the Spirit of God to do something, come and tell me what He moved you to do and let somebody pray with you, okay? All right, here we go.
Jesus, for your presence, for your goodness, Father. We worship you and we praise you. Amen. Church, you can have a seat real quick in this moment. Please continue to come up for prayer. We're going to briefly pause for a moment of communion together. You should have received some elements when you walked in, and if you didn't, that's okay. I think if you may be able to shoot your hand up and some of our team might spot you and be able to get it to you. I was thinking about what to say, you know, in this moment as we together and I got nothing. There was a word that came to me though in my spirit and it was, it's okay. So these elements that you take, the bread that represents the body that was broken, on the cross for us. The juice represents the blood that was spilt in our stead. These are the things that atone for the ways in which we've fallen short, that we aren't perfect, that we need the grace of Jesus with us. And I feel like the Holy Spirit and God just wants to let us know, let you know that it's okay. He's died for you. He's made the sacrifice for you and that he loves you and it's okay. Just give it to him. So take this time, take this next 30 minutes, 30 seconds, and we'll jump back in and continue in worship. You can take that time now.
to restore is your desire. surrender to the King of Kings. Let's sing Death Could Not Hold You. Come on. Death could not hold you. The veil torn before you. You silence the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring. The praise of
Please be seated. We're going to continue our worship today through our giving. Ah, oh, such a powerful sermon, isn't it? Yeah? Yes. So when, when, I, when I got hired here at One Old Church, my wife and I made a decision, okay, that giving was not going to be optional, that our first fruits were going to come off the top immediately. There was no option about that. Why did we do that? One, of course, because we love Jesus. We see the work that's going on around here, but really because I wasn't going to ask, we're going to ask you to do something that we weren't doing. Amen? I wasn't going to be asking you to give when we're not giving. So we are walking in obedience in that area. And the question that I have for you today is, are you walking in obedience in that area? Because it comes from the heart. You love Jesus, right? Pastor Jeff always talks about, we've got to, if you love Jesus, it's not going to be a problem. So today, my question is, are you walking in obedience and faithfulness in your giving? The ashes are going to come forward, and as we give, let's see what's happening at our church. We just heard Pastor Jeff share about how evangelism is done best one-on-one. -on -one. So who's your one life? Who's the one person that you are sharing Jesus with? And if you have that person, why not invite them to the Jesus Revolution movie for free? It's for free on the San Dimas campus, August 26th, and also on the Rancho campus, August 27th. It's going to be a free event for you to come and experience the Jesus Revolution movie when, in community with your church. Also, just a disclaimer, it is PG-13, so it's not suitable for young kids. But for more information about that, go to the One and All app so you can sign up and get your tickets for free. Fall is right around the corner, and that means community group season. We were created by God to be in community with one another, getting connected to our relationship with each other and with Him. We believe that we grow best in community, and so you can sign up for community. We got community groups for our youth. We got community groups for young adults. We got community groups for adults. And parents, don't forget, on the weekends, we have community groups for your kids when you bring them to church. And if you're in a community group, that's awesome. But if you're not, you can by going to the One and All app to get signed up for a community group now. You don't want to miss out on a chance to grow together in community. Have you heard? We just launched a 9 a.m. service at our West Covina campus. So if you live in West Covina, we've got a 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. service. And if you have a friend or a One Life who lives close to the West Covina campus, you should totally invite them. If you live close to the West Covina campus, you should totally come and hang out and be a part of bringing people who are far from God, near to God in West Covina. And if you want more information, you can go to the One and All app. Thank you for being a part of the One and All family. All right. Cool. Yeah. So if you live in West Covina, I encourage you, go to West Covina. Pastor Matt is awesome. He's the best. He's created a great community of people there, and they love people so much. So I encourage you, go to West Covina. All right. As we close, I want to invite you after church, we're going to do our last Saturday hang. All right. It's kind of closing out the summer. Uh, we're going to have the habit out here. You can purchase food and hang and eat. There's going to be free, what is it called? The ice stuff, whatever, slushy stuff, whatever. Thank you. Yeah, all that stuff. But there is, uh, you can buy the habit, sit down, habit, sit down on the patio, the bougie patio, and sit, relax, enjoy fellowship with one another. There's slides and stuff for kids. All right? Let's build community here at our church. Amen? All right, stand to your feet. And now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit remain with you this week. One hope and one life. God bless you guys. <laughs>